Hello, everyone. Welcome so much to this uh, Software Preservation Network quarterly community forum. We are thrilled, thrilled, thrilled. And I say that on behalf of the entire SPIN community, but most specifically on behalf of the SPIN uh, Community Engagement Cooperative uh, or Collaborative, which has been working diligently to put this event together, including inviting our esteemed guests, Elena and Vicki, to share their experience and work with you all here today. Um, so my name is Jessica Meyerson. I'm the a deputy director at Educopia Institute. Um, and yeah, Educopia is the, the host of the Software Preservation Network, SPIN. Today we're presenting Unshown and Untold. Um, and I offer my uh, sort of apologies on behalf of SPIN's community coordinator um, who couldn't be with us due to a family emergency today, but wanted to extend her gratitude to all of you that are attending tonight's um, event. So thank you so much. So today's Unshown and Untold is a roundtable on preservation use cases that traditionally struggle to gain attention compared to say high profile multimedia or creative works. Our discussion will be with two, again, of our very esteemed colleagues, Elena Colon Marrero, Senior Digital Archivist at the Computer History Museum, and Vicki Rampin, Librarian for Research Data Management and Reproducibility at NYU Libraries. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If y'all have any questions during the presentation, we welcome them first and foremost, but we ask that if the chat box is available to you as part of your participation here tonight, that you put those questions into the chat box for Zoom. Um, the other uh, members of the collaborative that are co-hosting this event tonight will bring them up during the presentation. We may also have time for questions at the end. Quick note that live auto transcription has been enabled for this meeting. So click the live transcript button at the bottom right of your Zoom screen to enable transcription. Um, or I, I believe, yeah, I believe that that's going. We're also being recorded. And I wanna thank our brave speakers for today and answering the call to demonstrate these software preservation, uh, their software preservation use cases in real time with all of you. Um, so expect to see technical failures. They're ubiquitous in software preservation and access workflows by design, as many of you know from personal experience. But the added layer of screen sharing through Zoom is another opportunity for technical issues. So use these as instructive. Um, we won't waste your time too much with troubleshooting. Uh, we'll be working on that in the background if we need to. Have a great, we have a great discussion lined up for y'all regardless of demonstration success. So please, um, uh, affirmation to both of your esteemed speakers and your colleagues organizing this event. We appreciate and thank you all for your patience and understanding in advance. And again, just pointing you to the uh, chat, that's where Diane and other members of the Engagement Collaborative are posting reminders about where you can access things like the shared meeting notes. And with that in mind, I'll hand it off. Okay, so getting some, uh, some chat in the background, we'll move forward to um, kind of introducing our speakers. And so y'all have a little bit of context for who you'll be hearing from today. Um, just another reminder, today is a little bit different. If you all have attended past uh, quarterly community forums, super excited about the show and tell format. Um, we're going to be discussing, discussing those use cases we don't often see, and we're going to start by asking our presenters some questions about their work. Uh, they'll demonstrate their software, and then we'll open the floor. So starting with Elena, a little more context for Elena's work. Again, Senior Digital Archivist at the Computer History Museum, where she managed their manages their historic software collection and digital repository. Elena is active on Twitter at, at Elena Archivist. Let her, let her know that you met her here, if you DM her, for example, about any follow-up questions. And the Computer History Museum is active at, at Computer History. 
Vicki Rampin, again, Librarian for Research Data Management and Reproducibility at NYU Division of Libraries. Vicki has led several projects related to software preservation, and she's actually spoken about ISAGE on a previous QCF, but including investigating and archiving the scholarly Git experience, or ISAGE for short, and collaborating on software archiving for institutions, COSI. Vicki is active on Twitter at Vicki at Vicki Rampin and online at Vicki.Rampin.org. So, okay. <clears throat> Thank you all so much, the two of you, for joining today. Um, we'd like to start the conversation by asking Elena and Vicki some questions. So, starting with you, Elena. Can you tell us, uh, the rest of the group, everyone present here today, a little bit about the types of software that the Computer History Museum collects? Like what are some of the most common types of software, for example, and what are some of the least common? Hey everyone. Um, so when it comes to the software collection at the Computer History Museum, we do have quite a large historic software collection that ranges anywhere from punch cards to paper tapes, um, all the way up to about uh, DVDs and DVD-ROMs and CD-ROMs. And we do also uh, contain source code in our collection as well. And what we have really kind of runs the gamut of software, almost anything that you could imagine um, from your operating systems to productivity software, video games, as well as like edutainment software, which is kind of one of the things I'll be demonstrating today. Um, the only things that we don't really collect in terms of software is anything kind of released within the last 10 years or so. Um, and we're also at this point have strayed away from doing things that are apps um, and anything kind of downloadable from the cloud, just because we don't have the capacity to collect those at this time. And so most of our collection um, is on some sort of physical media. Excellent, thank you so much, Elena. That was super helpful. Um, just because I know that the two of you are gonna get into the weeds of, of some of your work, um, I'll go ahead and pass it over to Vicki. So Vicki, can you give everyone um, on the call today just a little bit more context about uh, you know, data, software commonly used at NYU, like what kinds of file formats are the most common when using or exporting that data? Just speaking a little bit to the types of materials that you're engaged with on a regular basis. Yeah, so my work probably looks a lot different, or it definitely looks a lot different from Elena's. So um, I'm actually not typically working directly with like compiled binaries and popular software or widely used software. I tend to work mostly with research software, which is uh, code or software created for a specific purpose in research. So most of the time when I encounter or when I work with this type of material, it's in conjunction with other data. So uh, you've probably all heard about like R and Python. Those are really popular. I see a lot of like Python scripts and R scripts and things like that. Um, I tend to see uh, data in a far ranging amount of formats and uh, why software preservation has become so central to my job as a data management and reproducibility librarian is part and parcel that, you know, the more that you think about reproducibility, the less it becomes possible without like the work that uh, Elena does and, and others do in software preservation, like software preservation is the lowest layer necessary for long term reproducibility. Um, I'll give you an example, like I was assisting a researcher with a MATLAB script, MATLAB is also pretty popular. Um, and so I, I'll also say I work mostly with like workflows rather than discrete objects as well. So it's usually like one script does this, it reads this data, the output of that feeds another script. So I tend to, the stuff that I'm trying to preserve um, needs to be coupled with other things to be useful or other uh, executable or, um, yeah, other executable things to be useful. So I was working with this researcher who was using a MATLAB script and she was trying to run it on her Mac machine and I was trying to run it on my Linux machine. We had the same version of MATLAB and it couldn't work uh, with the same data. Like I unplugged it out of her computer, plugged it into mine. And we eventually found out that the script that she wrote could only be run on Mac. 
because of a dependency of a library of MATLAB that she was using. And we only found this out after a very intensive investigation. But yeah, so all that to say is like my niche or my area within software preservation is really focused on those types of issues, long-term rerunning of scholarly workflow that rely on code, that relies on operating systems and different other computational uh, dependencies. So that's sort of where I'm coming in at it. Um, so I don't necessarily like, I can think of some common file formats and script types, but I think none of them would surprise anyone. Like I mentioned Python and R and MATLAB are very popular. In terms of data people are working with, it's everything from like actual web data to you know your typical quant and qual formats. Um, so yeah, so the challenge is, is less about the actual files and uh, themselves and more about stitching everything together and kind of creating bundles of research that can be more easily preserved. Um, so a little bit different scope in than what uh, Elena and others are doing, but still something that I feel like, you know, could be classified as software preservation. Thank you so much for that, Vicky, and super helpful for you and Elena to kind of set up that um, that useful and I think what will be generative contrast when it comes to some of the questions from the folks in attendance today. I want to point out a couple of things um, that that Vicky highlighted. One is dependencies all the way down. Um, <laughs> And that's also true for, for um, some of the use cases that Elena and the Computer History Museum kind of context is exploring as well. So thinking about, yeah, your operating system platform in relationship to how, you know, an executable in Elena's case that you might run for commercial software is going to be able to meaningfully access or not a given piece of data or, or uh, other content wrapped in a file format. Um, so at any point along that chain or that stack, if you want to think about it vertically, um, at any at any point along that stack, you could have a potential discrepancy in terms of matching version or um, even maintenance issues with repositories where you have to grab that that code or or whatever the dependency is from. So yeah, and it's also interesting to think about how these two contrasting use cases, um, how as Elena and Vicky were both talking about their workflow, how do the use cases that your organization is going to emphasize or prioritize for software preservation and curation work, how that's going to shape ultimately the nature of the work that you're doing or like how you scope pro software preservation for you. So yeah, super interesting. Y'all set us up quite beautifully. And with that, I think everyone is in great anticipation of seeing, you know, kind of what y'all are talking about. So Elena, um, why don't we go ahead and move over to you and transition into uh, looking at the demonstrations. So Elena, what are you going to for us today like what was tell us a little bit about it maybe the most difficult aspect of preserving that software what it means for your user community show us what you got yeah so to give everyone context before i start sharing my screen and pull everything up um, i am going to be sharing this software that was in our collection called vote america and it was an early kind of interactive edutainment cd-rom that actively updated um, using kind of the internet. Um, and it was meant to help users determine who were they, who they were going to vote for in the 1996 presidential election. Um, generally at the museum, we actually don't emulate software. We just usually don't have the capacity for it. We have very limited staff and resources. And so if emulation is going to happen, it's through us imaging a disk and giving that to a researcher who wants to do that work. Um, this was a very rare case where people outside of the collections department, specifically education and marketing, uh, wanted to put together a list of materials surrounding elections for the 2020 election, they found this software and they're like, what can you do with it? Um, I said, I don't know, but I'll figure it out. I had already uh, gotten a disk image and extracted the files previously through a case study. And so I just made a copy of the files and took them to my home computer because I knew our IT department would not like me trying to emulate this and downloading uh, old programs from the internet. So I just kind of took the risk on my own computer to see, could I even get it to run? What would it look like? Um, and what could I produce uh, for 
an online presentation. And Diane has linked the blog post about the software kind of in the chat. And within that blog post, there are definitely video recordings of this software in process. Um, and I will just note that I'm not going to share the audio on uh, this application because it is very loud. And if I adjust the audio, it means I can't hear anything um, for the Zoom chat. So just to protect everyone's ears, um, you'll only be kind of seeing the screen, uh, but not hearing what things sound like. So I definitely recommend going to the YouTube playlist of all of the different modules if you want to hear what the sound is actually like. Um, and so if you give me a moment, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to take you from the very beginning of booting it up because if I navigate away, there is a very high likelihood that the application will freeze. Um, there's also a very high likelihood that the application is going to crash. Um, and we're going to just go ahead and get started and cross our fingers and see what happens. All right, so you all should just be seeing my desktop screen right now. And so I am going to kind of boot up the executable application. And one of the things I had to learn throughout this was what files I actually needed to navigate to. Um, since I'm using a very fancy gaming monitor, all of my resolution stuff is not the same as it would have been on a monitor in like 1995, uh, 96, because uh, this software was released in 95. And so the first thing I actually have to navigate to is the video that shows on load up. And as you will see, the video doesn't actually load. Like I'm hearing audio, um, and there are noises, but I don't see anything in this kind of uh, black box. And you can see like the little sliver of video that actually does appear. So I'm going to kind of skip through all of this intro video since it, you can't really hear it and you can't actually see it. Uh, but one of the things I did do in case someone wanted to see the video was extract all of the video files. And so I could play them on my desktop as if needed. Um, and so next we're going to kind of navigate to the launcher and it's going to load. Um, there are users here, I promise. Um, you just, for whatever reason today, can't see the names. It all depends on the day if you can see the names that are there. So I'm going to navigate to one of the pre-existing users. And this is kind of the screen that you see when you load up. Um, there are different modules here that include just a general introduction that plays a video in this box. I'm not going to do that because it always freezes if I do. Um, there is a long interactive uh, workshop about how elections work, and it just is a narrator telling you what the US election process is like. Uh, but one of the cool things is you can go down to this issues tab and see what the different presidential candidates had as issues. And one of the things that should show up but isn't today is there is text <laughs> in this screen um, that would give you information um, that they're pulling from various news sources about what each candidate um, thinks of the issues. And as the election moves on, you can update all of this uh, to see what things have changed. And so you can kind of navigate through that. I wish there was text there, but there just isn't today. Um, if you go back, you can even take a test your political IQ quiz. Um, and if the text was working, you could see the text and the questions um, and it would either light up um, if you got the answer correct or not. Um, so I am actually, because the text is not showing up at all, I am going to quit the program. And as you can see, the program doesn't actually quit, uh, <laughs> which is also one of the things that happens. But um, what I'm gonna show you now is just a video that I had taken on one of the days that the software worked. Um, and this is what the political IQ test should look like and what it should look like when text kind of shows up. Um, and you get a really loud buzzer sound if you get it wrong and you get a nice ring if you uh, get it right. And I will tell you, it took me way too long to get 100% on this quiz. Um, 
unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but this is kind of just what this software looks like. I definitely encourage um, you all to look at my blog post, uh, navigate to all the different videos that shows every single module um, in this uh, software, just to kind of see what it would be like to have a single place to go to kind of have all the information that you need to kind of make an informed decision. So I am going to stop sharing now. Elena, that was amazing. And I want to pause and, you know, touch, uh, just highlight a couple of things, which is the, the pathway to getting it where it is now in terms of you um, experimenting on your own laptop and things like that versus some of the secure organizational IT security concerns that you raised or flagged um, is like an might be a point of interest for, for some folks. Um, but yeah, there's a lot in there. I just want to invite everyone that's on the call right now, all 45 of you minus myself. <laughs> Um, to think about what questions that brought up for you, like actually seeing the results of Elena's work and stitching all those different pieces together to Vicki's earlier point, stitching all those people together, like how did that land for y'all? Um, you know, what do you think about that? Did you have questions about, about, you know, other more like technical details in terms of configuration leading up to that? So yeah, y'all, y'all think about your questions for Elena and start queuing them up in the chat. Um, the rest of the team that that's helping to co-host will be keeping an eye out and, and like starting to line the questions up in a row. And I see one from you and now. So yeah, we'll we'll put those um, we'll put those together. Before we do that, we're gonna make sure that because um, we know people will probably have a lot of questions. So we'll queue these up for both of our esteemed speakers. Um, before we dive into those questions, though, Vicky, what will you be demonstrating for us today? And what was the most difficult aspect of preserving the software that you're gonna be showing us? Yeah, so I'm going to be showing uh, an example using RepRozip, which is a started as a reproducibility tool. And then I sort of uh, came on the team and understood that it had a lot wider applications. So I'm going to be showing using RepRozip to make a reproducible and preservation ready bundle of a research workflow using R which is uh, pretty popular. This, ex this particular example comes from the humanities. Uh, it's a digital humanities um, analysis of school records, basically. So it's some R scripts that generate some plots that have gone into a book chapter. So this is all about making sure people have uh, long-term access to the materials underlying scholarship. So the hardest part is always like setting it up on your own machine first. So RepRozip as a tool for those who aren't uh, familiar, it's basically a packaging tool where you run it at the same time as a workflow. It packages all the dependencies into a single distributable bundle. And then you can use that bundle in lots of different places, like in Easy. Uh, you can use it in a Repro Server, which is a way to access RepRozip bundles in, in the cloud. Uh, a lot of other people's infrastructure are using it. So it's pretty widely used for lots of different uh, purposes, which is very cool. So, but the hardest part is, so you run RepRozip at the same time as something else. It requires you to set everything else up on your computer to use it, which is why this is actually a tool that we suggest uh, patrons to use. So this is more of a patron facing tool. Again, thinking about how can we get things uh, packaged, documented, and well-formed enough such that when it gets to the archive, uh, you know, it's ready to go or it's ready for ingest in the most minimal way possible. So with all that said, let me share my screen unless anyone has any questions about that, about anything I just said. Uh, I wanna share this one. All right, cool. So you should just be seeing a web browser right now. Um, I'm going to start off just showing you some context. So this is the plots that we're going to reproduce. They come from this volume, which is an edited uh, edited volume of lectures around Irish uh, Irish studies, which is where this particular example comes from. 
So you can see it relies on R. It has a bunch of different input and output files. It has about 21 different dependencies uh, that the researcher Dr. Wolf used with R. So RepRoZip doesn't just make a bundle. It also gives us a lot of this nice metadata too. Um, so, but with all, all right, with all that said, here is a vagrant machine using an older version of Ubuntu than I'm on currently. I'm on Ubuntu 2001. And uh, I just have like a, a virtual machine set up because ideally the cool thing about RepRoZip is that you can use it to set things up in completely different computational environments. But this is just really showing the workflow. So if I look and apologize ahead of time for my mechanical keyboard, unlike Elena, I will be unkind to your ears. Uh, <laughs> that's starting with that keyboard. So all right, so if we look in the Irish schools project folder, we see some data in CSVs. So there's a few CSVs. We see an R script. We see a readme about the data. Yay, that's good data management. A readme about the code, unusual, and we love it. And then some of these plots as PNG files. And then uh, this particular researcher also generated a PDF of all the plots. So in order to capture not only R, like R itself, because uh, when RepRoZip runs, I'm about to run it, it, uh, it not only captures the workflow, so like which of these data files was used first, um, that type of work is captured, but also some of that lower level information is captured. So what version of R, what version of each R package. And then at the end, when we create our package, it's gonna package all of those dependencies all together in one. So to run this script, let me clear my screen. Um, can people see my console okay, or should I zoom in? It looks pretty good. If you can zoom in just a little bit, that's probably, how, yeah, that's perfect. That's really good, okay, thank awesome. you so much. Yeah, no problem. All right, cool. So to run this, yeah, I click clack all the time with this mechanical keyboard. So to run an R script from the terminal, the way a researcher would do it in their daily practice was just to run R scripts, whatever, national wolf, a national schools wolf dot R. To be able to capture, like I said, the workflow, all of the dependencies, and uh, all of the extremely detailed and low level metadata about the uh, about the computational environment, we run represent trace. So ideally, this is done at the end of a researcher's workflow when they're sort of like ready to go when everything's ready to be published. And when we run that, the script should run as it normally does. So like this isn't represent. This is uh, this is Nick. <laughs> this is the researcher, and all of the metadata about what we did is written in this config file. So I don't know even if I have Vim installed on this. Uh, so if we look at this config file, oh, we can, yay. So you can see uh, actually the runs. So like I mentioned, what's important with preservation for research is not only getting uh, you know, the, some of the binaries, but also getting the ancillary materials. You can see how it was run. You can see when it, uh, in what distribution, what operating system it was run. You can see a lot of details about the environment. Uh, so this, not even uh, beyond just the capability of RepRoZip to make that uh, preservation ready bundle, it can also give us a lot of really useful information about uh, dependencies versions and metadata about packages that are being used by different research workflows. So that's pretty neat. Can I get out of here? Wow, I actually got out of here. So then, all right, so we did represent trace and now to create the bundle, all we need to do is represent pack and give it a name like nationalschools.rpz and nothing should happen. So no news is good news. And then hopefully if this works, yay. We have our distributable bundle that we can then uh, use in a lot of different ways. So we can interact with the preserved materials through RepRoServer, which I should just pop up here, which is just a way to interact with RepRoServer bundles on the web. I don't know if my internet is terrible. I was not expecting this to be the bad part of the, or the part of the demo that goes wrong. But uh, there's RepRoServer. <laughs> uh, 
And then we can also, of course, interact with it on our local computer. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna move all that stuff out of the way. All right, so we I uh, have created this RPZ file. I put it on my desktop, here it is. Now let's say like I'm a patron or I'm an archivist and I want to actually try and rerun this, see, verify that it works and also get a look at the materials inside. So we can do this also via the terminal. So now I'm switching from Ubuntu 16 to Ubuntu 21. And uh, let me exit out all these tabs that I had open to prepare for this. All right, cool. So rep, the cool thing about RepRozip is not only does it create these bundles, but we can interact with them a lot of different ways. So you can use Vagrant, Docker, Easy, uh, Repro server, like we can add and remove these connections as soon as there's a new container or VM software that we want to interoperate with or use in the future. So the actually repros of bundles that we packed back in 2012 are still usable today. So they're still actually like all the research can be reproduced from like nine years ago, which is pretty good. Um, so anyway, if we want to reproduce what I just packed, we do repro unzip, so you know the opposite of repro zip is repro unzip. I want to use Vagrant because I prefer it to Docker. I'm setting it up for the first time. I put in that National Schools RPZ, and then I give it somewhere to unpack to. And then as this runs, what it's going to be doing is it's going to be, you can see already over here, it created the directory. It's downloading all of the uh, metadata, or it's unpacking rather, all of the metadata, the dependencies, the input data, the scripts that actually run. And it's creating a virtual environment. So you can see it's creating a virtual environment and it will directly replicate the virtual environment that I packed it in. So this might take actually a while. It seems to be going pretty fast, which is nice. So it's just, it's. What it's doing is it's automatically creating the same computational environment from before on my computer. Um, obviously, like this will work best for modern operating systems or operating systems in the last 10 years to now. Um, I think there's a really great role to strengthen our connections to other tools and parts of the ecosystem, like easy for getting access to runtimes that you know we can't support with Repro Unzip. So there's still some work to be done and different pieces of the preservation puzzle to be worked out, but actually, um, yeah, it's pretty good. So cool, so everything ran. And now if we use repro unzip vagrant run, it's actually gonna rerun the analysis for us uh, to see if it gets the same results. So the similar that we saw, oops, I cleared it, similar in our other VM, when we saw this same stacking not well, we see it here and everything worked. And when I click into this folder, I can see the data, I can see that config file, I can see the vagrant file that was created for me. And I can also then download all the materials that came out of it with vagrant download. And this will get me all of those nice PNGs and beautiful plots that are the output of this particular research workflow. Vicky, so, yeah, that, so was that was me. Yeah. <laughs> Great, good. Yeah, that was super. And you know, I want to congratulate and say huge gratitude, uh, extend gratitude to both Vicky and Elena. Um, it, it's always a little nerve wracking, again, doing those live demos, they both went beautifully. And that's huge thanks to both of their preparation for, for getting those environments and all of the dependencies we didn't see uh, set up in order to show you all that. So yeah, that was awesome. Thank you so much, Vicky, that was great. Um, Let's see, so moving on from the demos, you know, we have questions for y'all. Uh, we have a couple queued up. We have one from Ewan. Um, we have another one that we can um, sort of invite both of our esteemed presenters today to respond to. Um, but before we, before we pass that Q&A discussion off to Diane to facilitate, I just want to, um, 
you know, invite everyone on the call, all 44 of us or so uh, today to think about like, what is surfacing for you here? You know, um, did you really cue in on some of those like workflow or kind of the technical components that underlie the demonstration? Are you interested on, um, to Ewan's question, which we'll go to first, are you interested on how these environments are being received um, by staff and colleagues that might be responsible for, for serving these environments up for end users? Um, you know, are you, do you have questions about the documentation for even knowing how to use some of this older software, like as its own kind of dependency um, as the configurers? Um, as many of you, the role that many of you might play in setting some of this up in your home institution. So yeah, just another invitation to, you know, to think about how this is landing for all of you in your own context and, um, and ask, you know, Vicki and Elena while they're here. I know they'd be, they'd be happy and thrilled to, to hear y'all's questions. So with that, we're up and quick note that in the, in the chat box, we've got slides from Vicki that she shared here. Um, and they have links and info, and it looks like some videos of, of other workflows that might be of interest and help contextualize the demo that Vicki just shared. So that's awesome. Thank you so much, Vicki. Um, yeah, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Diane for the Q&A and um, I'll keep an eye in the chat along with Jacob um, as y'all might be thinking about it. So continue to put your questions into the chat and we'll continue to queue them up and, and feed them to Diane. So thanks so much, y'all. Thank you. Um, I guess we'll start with Ewan's question um, that is to Elena. What was the reception to the emulated software? So everyone was pretty excited that I got something to work. Um, I know initially our education department really wanted to embed the software into our website so that um, especially like kids and teens could go and click around and use it, but that just wasn't possible. So my offer was the next best thing, thing is I can record videos of me using the software and that's pretty much what we can use. Um, so that's what I did. And so they are very like thankful that we at least had that kind of thing. And for most people in the museum, it was the first time they really saw uh, software in our collection run that wasn't a part of a different huge initiative that took well over a year to do. Um, this just, it wasn't actually very hard to get the software up and running. It was actually harder to get it to run properly at least once for me to record uh, screen captures on my computer. That's really cool. And that, that kind of squares with some of my experience as well. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, oh, I'm sorry. A cat just jumped into my lap. Um, he has a question that he put into the chat. That's a question for both Elena and Vicki. Um, can you discuss um, more about how your designated user communities for these environments are sort of formulated? Um, how are you kind of soliciting user needs or you know, how are you finding out what people might need? I realize that's big and broad and I have a very, I have another specific question for Vicki too, but if you wanna go for the big and broad one, go for that one first and then I'll, I'll, I'll ask my other question. Yeah, I can start us off with this. So, uh, oh my God, all I do is talk to patrons pretty much. So I, I, a lot of what I have grown into supporting during my time at NYU and a lot of how my, um, how different like infrastructure has sort of, it's been sort of organic. Um, so it's been a lot of back and forth with patrons. I've done some dedicated user studies for certain types of, um, for certain types of work like around software management in particular. Um, but in terms of soliciting needs, it's, uh, it's, a, it's part and parcel a large part of my job in consulting on data management and reproducibility best practices. So I see a lot of needs just every day emerging from those. Um, the, the communicating those effectively, I think, has been my challenge. Um, and communicating how building interoperability only helps us has been a challenge. Um, 
So in terms of understanding users, doing some of those patron facing services has helped sort of guide the way different software and services has emerged. And yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Like I just do a lot of talking to patrons and I, I get their needs from those conversations. Um, I also, I guess I also keep abreast of like professional conversations around this. Like I'm involved in a lot of professional conversations around reproducibility and they inevitably fall back to digital preservation every time anyone talks about anything, data, code. It's like, yeah, talk to us more, <laughs> we're here. So uh, yeah, I see, I see a lot of needs everywhere. Do you mind Sorry, if I ask I you if that was super helpful? It's not. No, that helpful. is. I was actually wondering if I could ask you a follow up question to that, which was the question I was thinking of earlier. Um, is it hard to get buy in from researchers to incorporate this into their workflow? I know that, you know, in early sort of research data management, the notion of writing a data management plan was sort of like, oh, it's all this work, you know, it's a kind of unfunded mandate. And there wasn't like a long term benefit really kind of outlined, except for the sort of we need to preserve this so that people can reproduce it. So I'm wondering how you kind of generate buy in from researchers to kind of pull this into their workflow. Yeah, a lot of the time it's about building efficiency for themselves and taking that angle makes it a lot, uh, makes it a lot easier. So for instance, like when one graduate student leaves a lab and another one joins a lab, a lot of code breaks in that transition. And so a lot of like the work of putting together software management um, practices and depositing code and writing read means and using repressive like a, there's a non insignificant part of my patron population my designated user community that like is eager for a solution to common problems. Um, whether or not repressive is that solution is a different story like there are other tools that work for did better for different needs. Um, like Holtail is a great is a great uh, product in the reproducibility space, and they integrate with a few repositories. But I don't know how much they're doing for or how much they're uh, interoperating with preservation systems just yet. But um, so there's a bunch of people who want it for efficiency reasons. However, um, they want something quick and easy and that immediately integrates into their workflow. So there's definitely like some more impetus uh, around. It's not like back in the days that you were describing then when people were like, do it because it's altruistic. We like have some selfish reasons why they should work responsibly. <laughs> like you get more citations if your materials are open and usable. Uh, you know, that's a pretty big one in at least the academic sector where I work in. Um, and telling horror stories like I pull up retraction watch and I'm like these people had no data management plan their code no one knew if it actually existed and their stuff is retracted and you don't want that to happen to you. Um, <laughs> you know, I have quite a few. Uh, I have a quite a quite a few of those like horror stories in my back pocket so um, and then there's like the bottom up and the top down mandates. So the bottom up mandates are really interesting because it's like grad students who are sick of doing things over a thousand times and want like are eager for some structure and routine and management and use of tools like represent or whole tail or similar uh, similar tools in the space. And then there's the top down when like PIs hear about reproducibility and hear about preservation and they're like, we should be doing that <laughs> and uh, solicit. So I get I have some problems in uh, getting buy-in for RDM and reproducibility and using toolkits like this in general, because it's like another thing people see as adding to their workflow rather than enhancing it. But I think there are good strategies for communicating why it's important and why it's worth like, you know, the front loaded effort of changing your workflow. Thanks. Um, I see that Jacob also has a follow-up in the chat. Um, he's curious as to how much more challenging retaining or losing institutional or departmental in this case knowledge is with this work. Yes, yeah, so it seems to me like Elena could answer that too, because I would also be curious, like, you know, uh, preservation shops tend to be small and digital preservation shops tend to be smaller. So I'm really interested in her answer to that question too. Yeah, but too. for me, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. 
Sorry, you go ahead. Okay, sorry. I was just going to say, in terms of uh, my challenge is, is there's a ton of lost institutional. It's more like lab or research group based. There's so much knowledge loss. It's like unquantifiable when I think about it. Like it keeps me up. Um, and it always has to do with turnover <laughs> uh, with students and staff, especially. So it's a huge challenge. And it's again, like one of the top reasons why people actually end up adopting like software management or research management practices that again, like I see those as pre-custodial labor of these materials that we would like ideally want to end up in, in an archive. So there's a ton, it's a huge challenge, um, but we know there are solutions. And it goes back to the original question of like, how are we soliciting user needs and how are we getting them to act or how are we uh, showing them that it's acting in their best interest actually to follow some of these principles. But yeah, I'd be really interested in, in Elena's thoughts on this question too, well. more broadly. <laughs> my thoughts um, probably aren't going to make anyone happy uh, <laughs> to this question, but as far as like when it comes to the first broad question about like soliciting user needs and stuff, we don't. Uh, emulation is just not a priority for the museum point blank. Um, I am honestly the only person that has the ability to really do it with our software that we have, aside from a few curators that might do it for their own projects, but that's for their own projects. Um, and usually like in this case, it's just something fun. I advocated to spend time on and I got approval to spend time on. And the most that we've been able to do is take part in the easy uh, pilot program this past year. And that's only because I pushed for it. And I pushed that the museum should at least try. And I did try to run Vote America in it and was unsuccessful uh, trying to run the software um, in easy. But when it comes to kind of institutional knowledge and turnover, honestly, that's just lost whenever someone leaves. And at the museum this week, it's going to be another loss of when someone leaves because um, I'm leaving the museum. And so there's really nothing there for anyone to try to replicate what I did. Um, and there's no incentive to also document that because that's just not the direction the museum is going in right now. There's a lot of other um, technical things that need to happen just so we have a good technical infrastructure to support our most basic needs. So emulation is this um, kind of a cherry on top. Like if we can get there, that's great, but that's just not where anything is headed. And so I wish I had like a better answer that was more like roses and sunshine um, in regards to that. Um, but unfortunately, like the case is it's just lost when a person leaves. Well, can I ask you sort of your your blue sky sort of if you had if you had your resources that you wanted to sort of document how you pulled this together so that you could sustain a sort of emulation program where you are either, you know, where you're currently are in just leaving or in you know your any future context what what would that look like how would how would you feel like people who are providing access to software like this should be best supported well my idea is that whatever documentation is left is something that a person off the street could theoretically pick up and try to run themselves so something that is kind of thinks of as many of the things that could go wrong and the possibilities that are there, but also leaving the tools um, available for people. Because for me, I just uh, Googled a um, Microsoft Windows 3.1 emulator and just chose whatever showed up. Um, but those links may not last forever. And those files may just kind of get lost. And so um, having a place to just deposit all of that information so people could pull from it. But also, I think I would really love to see kind of easy, really take off. I think that is going to be probably the best way 
for institutions to kind of move forward with emulation so that we can share and resource share the tools that each other needs. Like the museum has a ton of software that probably other institutions could use to run the files that they have. And it would be great if there was a place to solicit that kind of information and to have that kind of file exchange. Um, and so that's kind of like the dream that I see is just a central place for kind of resource sharing uh, to be able to run things and to ask for help. Uh, because I, I know I definitely have to ask for help when emulating things because I just like don't know a lot of this uh, kind of naturally. It's not my background. Um, and so just kind of having that central repository, um, I guess, is my dream and like instructions that can be shared with one another in one place would be my dream as well. So that you don't have to reinvent the wheel when you're trying to um, run a piece of software in your collection or try to like render a file um, in your collection that you can't render other otherwise. Oh, yeah, Elena, that... we've got to talk about COSI then, <laughs> which is my upcoming project about uh, software preservation that touches on a lot of what you just said. I definitely think like, sorry, Dan, I don't mean to cut in if there's another question, but like, I think it's really important to talk about what we don't know, what's not being taught and how resources are distributed and especially how these collections are, or how the work is being managed at an institutional level, which I know like SPIN and people at SPIN care about too, um, or we all care about. But uh, I just wanna thank you for sharing, sharing all that as well, because it's super important to hear and know you're not alone as well. So, sorry, sorry, Diane, it's all you. If there are other no, questions. No, no, I was, I put in the chat to you personally that that was better than any question I could have followed up with in the moment. I'm really glad that everyone is bringing this up because that's the dream too, right? We want to be able to share these resources. I know from my own experience, you know, you kind of like look for bits and pieces on Internet Archive from some, you know, forums, but, you know, having things kind of coordinated, there's really no substitute for having things coordinated across sort of a professional kind of like network of peers. Does anyone have any other questions you want to put in the chat for our, our speakers right now? We have a few minutes um, to wrap up. Ewan has another question. Um, Elena, are there things the EASY team could be helping with to enhance your ability to advocate for emulation at organizations like yours? I think that's just a really tough question to answer because I think at the heart of it, the organization knows that emulation is important and that's probably the only way we're going to get um, good use out of our software collection specifically. Like we have a collecting plan and it is noted in the collecting plan that has been read and approved essentially up the line, up through the board and like even our board recognizes it. Um, but the problem becomes when you don't have the infrastructure to even properly um, describe your materials, right? And so it becomes a more basic problem where we need to solve like our collection management system that is old and we need something new so that we can actually find the software that we wanna share with everyone or even just getting uh, the proper staffing to be able to catalog our software collection. Like our collection, more than half of it is not even cataloged. There is really very little intellectual control on it. And so that becomes really hard to know what you have that would be interesting and would be the shiny thing to emulate, to bring in resources to further um, kind of the emulation services. And so like, I, I'm i not necessarily sure what kind of resources Bing could advocate when the problem isn't um, emulation. It's more of we don't have the basic resources to even know what we have. Um, and it's hard. The, other, the emulation part is like the down the line thing. Once we know we can have proper preservation and control over just the massive collection that we do have. Elena, huge thanks to you for helping us to kind of zoom out, you know, just repeating after Diane. I, um, 
in terms of like Vicky's follow up, I feel like you kind of landing that landing us there at as the wrap up to today's quarterly community forum is like quite elegant. Um, and for all for all of us to remember, I mean, we are talking about a specific set of activities within this kind of like broader portfolio of digital curation and stewardship services. And so, you know, while we are talking about collecting software and all these things, I think for a lot of institutions on the call, there's probably quite a bit of resonance about how do you extend the scope of digital curation and digital stewardship services beyond the materials you have now, you know, when you feel like whether it's terms of description, um, administrative metadata, intellectual control, or bit level, you know, uh, duplicative preservation, like if those benchmarks aren't being met, you know, how do you walk that line between knowing what's coming down the pike and being prepared for it? So sort of like anticipatory planning there around software preservation and, and emulation. Um, and at the same time, sort of we're all kind of challenged with these capacity uh, issues. And so, yeah, I'll just highlight uh, resources on the SPIN website and some of the prompts that have come out of its affiliated projects, including EASY. Um, and also FCOP in terms of at least starting to have initial conversations institutionally about where this fits into your broader organizational portfolio uh, for end user services. So yeah, lots to discuss there. I feel like uh, Vicki and Elena queued up quite beautifully several follow-up discussions. And so stay tuned. Um, what I will say is just huge thanks to all of you for attending. Um, for active listening, for your participation in the chat. Um, we hope that any thoughts that you have after this, you kind of bring back to the community with you and, and, and help us keep developing our shared understanding around these questions. Uh, this event, again, has been recorded, so we'll be sharing it back out with the world. Just keep an eye on the Software Preservation uh, Network Twitter or our public listserv. Um, and you can find that at uh, bit.ly slash spin dash listserv and you'll we'll be sending out the recording to that list and um, in future newsletters and announcements you'll hear about more opportunities to, to join these conversations. So huge thanks to everyone. Yes, agreed Doug. Awesome demos, awesome discussion. Huge thanks to the spin community engagement collaborative. Um, I wish you all wherever you are, whatever time it is for you, a lovely like rest of your day, evening, um, and a great finish to your week. We hope to see you all at the next quarterly community forum. Thanks so much.